if you probably were live on X and YouTube, I'm not 100% sure. If we are, let us know in the comment section below. We're here talking about Palantir. It's path to a trillion dollars with Arnie himself. You've probably seen him a couple of times on this channel, on Amit's channel, on X, great Substack as well. Link to his X is in the description right now. Arnie, welcome back. Maybe Arnie cannot hear me. No, uh, we could. Uh, sorry, <laughs> I was hearing uh, too <laughs> from too many sites on uh, YouTube, uh, on X, <laughs> and on uh, Restream. Okay, here we are. Here I am. Sorry. <laughs> but so welcome, <laughs> welcome on the channel <laughs> again. Uh, well, thank you for having me here. It's a pleasure. Okay, so first up, how's everything? How's everything been since the last time you came on the channel? Um, anything new we need to know about? your channel, the Substack on X, where can people find you? Usually you do this at the end, but I want to do this at the start because mm -hmm. maybe towards the end people will already leave. So you can plug in everything that has been going on with you. Well, I was used to have uh, a very active uh, all three channels. Uh, right now I'm more on the standby on uh, YouTube because I realized uh, that making videos and actually writing require a very different uh, mindset therefore right now i'm more focused on x and also sharing articles uh, weekly recap mainly but also research articles on uh, on substack and i let them work more in uh, in uh, symbiosis and i i hope to return active on uh, youtube uh, over time uh, but first i'd like to make this uh, substack x combination uh, work bet for better first okay perfect perfect um, so definitely go following on X if you have not done so, so far. Ola here, go Arnie. Yes, Forza Arnie. We're all in the same <laughs> the same vibe here. Um, and so talking about exposure on X, you did write a great post on X, which we're going to talk about in, in just a bit, talking about Palantir's road to a trillion dollars. Now it's very important to note to everyone that is watching or listening, that these are just assumptions being made right now. This is not a oh Palantir to a million, Palantir thousand dollar price target, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, this is purely looking at the path towards a trillion dollar. What has to be done for Palantir to reach such evaluation? What multiples should be put on the stock? What multiples will be put on the revenues, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Mm -hmm. Now currently. Uh, Palantir sits at $16.39, so technically we have not really been moving that much for the past six months or so. But in my opinion, I think next earnings report um, and call especially is going to be quite interesting. Um, what are Before we jump into your poll, what are your current expectations? Because recently we have seen a lot of news with regards to, to Palantir, AI, uh, governments, spending, defense contracts, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, what going since this is the start of 2024? What are your expectations? Well, previously you mentioned uh, that uh, six months have passed, uh, yet uh, essentially nothing really happened to the stock. Actually, we went from flat to minus around minus five, minus ten. And if we think of it, uh, that's actually weird. It is weird because uh, in these uh, six months. I think we have been uh, seeing uh, very closely the most uh, effective transformation the business ever had since uh, its uh, beginning, beginning of the journey in uh, 20 years. Why I say that? Well, we got uh, a new product merging perfectly a wave in interest, which comes from AI. The new platform, AIP, is essentially the key to unlock uh, AI into enterprises and government. And uh, even if uh, this seems like, oh, okay, it's just one product, this uh, one product alone is not only interesting because it allows to capture this interest that is uh, in AI, but actually it disrupted uh, the entire business of uh, Palantir itself. We know that the bottleneck Palantir had was in the acquiring phase because in order to get a customer, it needed to work uh, like six months for a pilot. And after this pilot, it was like, please give us this contract. 
<laughs> so you spend six months of effort with forward deployment engineers, collaborating with the client, six months of uh, running the cost for this pilot, and uh, a high uncertainty at the end of this uh, pilot if the customer actually is willing to pay for uh, this uh, product, if uh, he understands uh, there is uh, a need, a real need, uh, rather than, okay, I can build this on my own. With AIP, what Palantir came out was a completely different go-to-market. Since with AIP, by leveraging the power of uh, LLMs, so be that ChatGPT or uh, all other models, Palantir essentially created uh, a new way to sell this product. Palantir is not strong at uh, direct sales, but it is very strong at building products that work in a relatively little time. And with AAP, we went from a six month pilot to boot camps of a couple of days. This changed completely the dynamic of uh, the business because also allowed not only to get more customers and uh, to expand more into existing customers by having uh, an offering that can unlock their value so it is very appealing for them, but uh, also creating a lot of efficiencies that translated into higher margins. So in the last quarter, to recap a little bit, essentially what we have been assisted was uh, a revenue growth acceleration, still not that huge growth acceleration, but significant enough uh, to say, okay, the growth is now rebounding. We are accelerating again after many months uh, of uh, declining uh, growth expectations, which actually made the stock gradually <laughs> being uh, depressed. But combined to this, also an expansion of the margins, which, is, which was uh, probably the thing that surprised uh, the market the most. It surprised even Bar the Barclays uh, analyst, uh, Mariana, who at the earnings call asked, uh, can you actually explain how this happened, like what what is this margin come from? And the real answer was boot camps. Boot camps are an extremely effective way to get customers to make customers happy. In two days, they can go home after these boot camps are already having something that works that starts solving a problem they have. So that tangibility actually becomes less cost for Palantir, more clients happy and higher satisfaction of these customers. So this is something that we really need to think of when we think of uh, what's coming next for Palantir. Because uh, if uh, previously we could expect Palantir to gradually grow and uh, hoping for something bad to happen, to, to have clients realizing, okay, I need to invest more in supply chain products. I need to be more effective in managing costs and so on. Now with uh, this interest in AI combined with boot camps, uh, a lot of customers can be onboarded quicker and uh, they can expand also better. So AP is the, boot is, uh, the game changer, which uh, in my opinion, transformed Palantir from, oh, I hope it will return to a 30% growth uh, to, hey, wait a second. Now there is a substance in terms of product market fit, go to market, combined with a huge, huge interest in AI, which is expected to grow at around 23% CAGR for many years to come, reaching an insane amount of billions in total size numbers. So combined these two, I expect Palantir to gradually accelerate. Now we are around close to 20%. I personally expect we will see like a gradual acceleration quarter by quarter and to get again to that uh, 30, 30 something percent. So that's my broad uh, expectation. Yeah, I think, I mean, right now, if we if we go and, and look at the expectations for, for, I mean, this year, I think most analysts are only expecting, I mean, for calendar year 2024, the expectations right now for sales growth is just at, 19.67% year over year. Um, for EPS adjusted, that's 18.7% year over year on a gap basis, a big, big increase. But yeah, currently it seems like analysts are still not really, 
I mean, I don't think Panettiere has convinced, let's say, analysts that, well, we can go back to the 30% growth year over year. So analysts are still like, okay, now we're still back in the 20% year over year growth. Let's let's see, show us what you've got, and then maybe we're up, we'll upgrade our expectations. Um, of course, it will probably happen when the stock is a bit higher because price uh, uh, sentiment will drive the, the price. So yeah, I think maybe that's why the, the stock hasn't really moved much that in the last six months or so, in my opinion. Well, you are exactly right. Uh, it's The earnings will be on the 5th of February and mm -hmm. analysts are just uh, cautious. Are cautious because, uh, well, Palantir is not really an easy stock to sell to, to clients and uh, probably they're already been uh, traumatized. Uh, so now they're scared uh, of being too optimistic. Uh, they want a further proof of uh, this uh, reacceleration we were discussing. What I think are two interesting data points is that, as you mentioned, analysts are still expect uh, Palantir to grow around 20% for the years to come. And if you really understand the business of Palantir, you realize that this 20% uh, is not actually that much. Especially mm -hmm. if we mentioned, uh, hey, the AI market, which is exactly the market where Palantir is, is expected to grow at 23%. This implicitly means that uh, the analyst expectations imply that Palantir would lose market share rather than actually gaining market share, which I think it is uh, what is going to happen because uh, essentially AAP is uh, unlocking a lot of value. We have been seeing that uh, with uh, AAP cons. We have been seeing feedback from um, uh, the boot camps, and we know that uh, Palantir already has huge clients proving use cases. So it's not only chat, but it's true business value unlocked. Be that uh, reduced time to produce, uh, to manufacture, less time to manage uh, patients uh, in the hospitals. So the amount of use cases that are being uh, available are so much and so effective that uh, I believe uh, Palantir is actually set to gain market share rather than to decrease market share. And a second data point that I found uh, particularly interesting is that uh, there was uh, an analyst from Jefferies who said um, the um, disclosed uh, the weirdest uh, report I've ever read. Essentially, he mentioned we downgrade Palantir from $18 per share to $13 per share. Why? because the stock has run up too much. And I, I was kind of puzzled um, by that. But on the other hand, uh, this analyst uh, said, uh, we are optimistic on the long-term trajectory of the business, yet uh, we are still not very, not very convinced of AAP monetization yet. So, and the stock went up too much, so we don't downgrade, downgrade the stock. What this means to my eyes is that, uh, look, wait a second. If an analyst that is still not very convinced, uh, is kind of skeptical, says uh, that the price target for him uh, is uh, $13 per share, which is not that far actually from the current uh, $16 per share. That to me is a hint that, uh, okay, that uh, $13 is probably a base, a mental base, uh, <laughs> from from which it is hard uh, to go below. Also considering that uh, now there is a $1 billion buyback that potentially could be thrown <laughs> on the stock if the management wanted, if the management sees the opportunity to actually to capitalize on a lower price. So with these considerations, I'm personally very excited uh, to go into this uh, queue for earnings. I think they will be positive. Uh, if not, uh, it's not the end of the world, I would say. Yeah, okay, fair enough. I've pulled up the the exact uh, analyst that you've that you've talked about right now, um, which yeah, I believe there was there was the same sort of let's say note about SoFi with some other uh, explanations there, but also yeah, the stock has gone up too fast, and so that's why. I'm now bearish on that company, I mean, which to me doesn't make that much sense because I thought analysts are supposed to be long-term investors, not traders. But okay, I guess well, if you... I was expected the analysts to be... I, I can't say long-term investors because their target is essentially a one-year target. 
Yeah. But I find I find weird to say that a stock is now worth less because the stock has gone up. That is something that I really can't <laughs> digest. Yeah, no, I mean, it does seem sometimes like these these guys are looking at ticker symbols instead of the company behind the the ticker symbol, which again doesn't make that much sense. And also the timing of it, right? It's extremely strange that they wait until it drops from 21 to 16, 17 dollars or so, and then release the note. Instead of saying at 21 dollars, when the stock had momentum, show me you've got conviction in your let's say sell rating when the stock has momentum and it is going higher and higher don't come out with the, with the note saying oh it's gone up too much and so now i'm downgrading to i mean it just shows that well sentiment uh, follows I think the price this was uh, perfectly matching uh, what uh, our book called the uh, halo effect uh, says uh, essentially hinting uh, you'll see the most negative news uh, exactly when things are really going bad and that is no different from what happened actually all uh, last year well not 2023 2022 when the stock was going down you only could see negative uh, articles the stock started going up only positive articles so yes the timing of this article was very suspicious and I could say, okay, when the stock went uh, in no time from 15 to 21, that was a good moment to actually say, okay, maybe now it has run up a little bit. And that is was that was uh, what we discussed at Palantir Weekly. We discussed a lot. Uh, okay, we are not currently buying at this price. We are not neither selling, but we are aware that the valuation is not attractive. I mean... Maybe in a quarter or two, depending on what on the numbers we're we're getting soon, maybe it will become attractive at those prices. Again, it remains to be seen what the growth rates are, uh, the progress there with regards to to the boot camps. But I do want to show one thing that came up um, today, which again we get I think tomorrow a clip of uh, Alex Carp there in in Davos that that he's going to appear on the CNBC uh, interview, which I always like as he always always talks uh, in a very enthusiastic way when, when he's there. But yeah, there was this, this thing from Axios that came out, basically said US eating everyone's lunch on AI. I'm, I'm reading this now before we jump into your, uh, in your post because it, it will be a big aspect of, of the post. So I basically said here that within 10 years, around 95% of the world's top tech companies will be Americans thanks to the US lead in AI. Um, they continue the conversation here. It basically says here, crazy political situation and GDP growth. That's much better than a nice political situation and no GDP growth. Um, then continuing here, of course, comparing um, American companies, American products, his own products to the example here in Germany. So any of the products we built would be the number one startup in Germany. And, and we have five. Um, just shows basically the huge confidence um, he has in his own products. I mean, we, we've seen that in plenty, in plenty of, of presentations already with Palantir. The fact, whether you like it or not, the fact that their pricing strategy basically doesn't really exist, um, just shows confidence in the product. Of course, of course, it's it's great to hear that, but we would love to see then follow up in in the financials as well, probably. Um, I'm probably we'll have to wait a couple of weeks until we get the numbers, but so far so good. I don't think he will keep on talking like that. I don't think we're, we're going to see so many more partnerships if that was not the case, if the product was not solving solutions, if companies using Palantir products were not seeing results. I mean, if you, if you look at the videos, AIPCon, you've seen examples of leaders from other companies saying, look, we've used this product. These are the results. It's great. And if we're having to talk about a, a current scenario, Airbus, Boeing, I mean, the results here speak volume. And I did hear, I did already listen to Sham's um, interview with uh, Tom Nash, not the Palantir guy, by the way, um, talk about Airbus and Boeing. And I think he did mention, I don't know if you listened to it already, mm -hmm. You did. He did mention something interesting with regards to that to that partnership. So 
every partner of Airbus can also use the solution. Mm -hmm. And he also mentioned something with Boeing. I can't remember exactly the words, but it does seem like there is a way for them to somehow work together. Mm -hmm. You want to expand maybe on 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 that topic? Cause... Well, uh, I love the fact that uh, essentially Sham in that interview explained uh, what uh, I did uh, uh, last year, writing uh, an article on, especially on uh, Skywise, because uh, in the community there was this uh, big uh, question mark. Okay, we know that Airbus building with Palantir Skywise is essentially the biggest uh, project uh, they've ever built, the most successful one. It took uh, many years to see the results. And we know that uh, Airbus uh, is heavily affected by Palantir Skywise. But how? Essentially, with this Skywise, uh, Airbus was able to fasten up the production by around 30% uh, of uh, the A350, and then also to make the production safer and also have uh, the existing fleet more safe uh, because uh, with a lot of sensors all integrated, it was easier to say, okay, this plane actually requires preventive min maintenance. It's better to work on this plane before it flies and so on. But uh, essentially Airbus with, um, started uh, working with Palantir for its own pro problems. This uh, uh, production problem they had, uh, they promised uh, 50 are, uh, airplanes and they were at uh, 16 and they needed to finish these, <laughs> these uh, remaining ones. How they did it with Skywise, basically integrating all the data sources, the big, big mess they had internally. Imagine uh, Airbus is uh, a truly global company, many different teams, uh, many different parts. Uh, the process of actually building an airplane is uh, a mess. and. Uh, when you have such a mess and you don't have a unified data structure, you are in a big, big problem. Because uh, even asking a simple question like, uh, okay, where I am exactly in the process of actually building this plane, it is a very tough answer to question if you don't have the right, uh, the right data in, organized in a nice way, what we would call an ontology. And essentially, Palantir started working with Airbus by doing this. And by doing this, uh, they helped uh, Airbus uh, understand uh, what they were doing uh, and uh, fasten up uh, the process of uh, building the airplanes by 33%. Given the success, they realized that uh, what we have been uh, developing internally, they now started, started calling it Skywise. They essentially extended it to the fleet. They started selling it to clients. Essentially, when Airbus was uh, selling the plane, it was also selling the software to optimize these, uh, these planes uh, and to be sure that the planes uh, were actually safe. This uh, is essentially a software solution that Airbus was initially giving it for free for uh, clients, but there are also modules like uh, exactly the augmented uh, preventing maintenance, uh, reliability control uh, and uh, other stuff, other applications that were unpaid. Essentially, Airbus this way becomes a software seller. And uh, Shem in that interview also mentioned uh, a data that uh, refreshed what uh, we knew previously. We knew that uh, um, Skywise was developed by, was used by many, many planes, like uh, 20,000 planes. Uh, and I, re I remember like 50% uh, of the world uh, fleet including uh, Boeing, but now it is a uh, two third. This is what uh, Xiam said. So what Palantir is doing with Airbus is uh, the master plan of what we could expect uh, as a successful use case over many years. Remember, Airbus started working with Palantir in 2015. So now almost uh, 10 years later, we see the huge effect that Palantir can have. Probably Airbus is one of the clients that spends on Palantir more. Probably it is one of those uh, three clients spending around $100 million per year, essentially to run uh, Skywise, which is also used by the Airbus clients. Because the Airbus clients 
they have uh, these uh, fleet of airplanes, their job is to make people move from A to B. It's not uh, being, it's not uh, putting the hands on the planes. They pay Airbus for that. And uh, essentially for them, what is really crucial is that every plane perfectly works. There are no problems. Airbus needs to be reliable. The airline just needs to say, okay, this plane actually works. Doesn't, me, doesn't give me any headache. The plane doesn't stay on the ground because if it stays on the ground, that becomes a, a huge cost for me and also a reputational damage. So planes on the ground is the worst thing ever for airlines. And we know that uh, the problem I, um, Boeing is uh, currently having uh, with uh, the 37, uh, sorry, the 737 MAX. Uh, we had uh, a couple of years of a couple of weeks ago, a new problem, uh, but essentially this plane is actually very problematic on its own. A lot of these problems could potentially be prevented. I've been said, oh, Arnie, but you can't change the corporate culture. That's true, but it is the corporate culture that actually generates uh, this uh, problem at the origin, because uh, it is uh, when you are not any longer a very deep uh, engineering focused, uh, product focused company that you start optimizing uh, by revenues and profits, more importantly, because you have an MA and an, an MBA mindset rather than an engineering mindset that you go on uh, cutting costs uh, where you think uh, they're not needed. So essentially what happened was uh, Airbus was doubling down, tripling down their efforts in uh, softwareizing everything with Palantir. Boeing uh, started paying uh, $9 per hour for uh, outsourcing uh, software engineering skills. And uh, yes, but uh, how could Palantir, so have, Palantir have prevented uh, what happened to Boeing? Uh, what happened to Boeing was essentially a bolt uh, that was not fixed uh, well. True, Palantir couldn't have uh, solved that bolt, but uh, with the right sensors, with the right platform to actually understand completely, imagine a digital twin of a plane, there you can understand uh, very little signals uh, from the sensors. Uh, okay, wait a second, here we lose uh, some pressure here and there. Maybe there's a problem before you start flying. Have a look at that. Essentially, this is exactly what uh, Skyway does. Skyway does this uh, for all the planes uh, Airbus uh, sells, but uh, they can be potentially integrated also with Boeing. So here we see how beautiful this uh, platform is because uh, it is uh, essentially an operating system for the entire aviation used by Airbus which is a critical nerve of the industry, is used by all its networks. So the airlines, the suppliers of Airbus, and even the competitor can actually use that. And think of Boeing. The Boeing doesn't really have now 10 years to spend to develop a platform to make airplanes safe. Their reputation is already very damaged and now, they can't really rush, uh, okay, we build the uh, Skyways uh, from scratch. Uh, I, uh, Skyways was built uh, in 2017. And uh, in order to make a platform work and work well, it needs a lot of data, a lot of users, and a lot of airlines uh, actually using that, contributing to more and more data. So good luck, Boeing. Couldn't have said it any better. And Ola here says, um... Yep, predictive maintenance will be crucial for airlines. So the fit of Palantir is the sweet spot. Like you said, digital twins are going to be extremely crucial here. And I mean, Palantir already, do, already does something pretty similar also with Ferrari in F1. Um, I mean, it's the most high tech vehicle, I think on the planet, an F1 vehicle. It has plenty of sensors everywhere. If there's a hair that touches the front wing, they will be notified. So I think with airplanes, I mean, you'd be stupid not to, to use Skywise in the future. And it also shows you what Palantir can do because here we're talking about the, the uh, aerospace airlines industry. Palantir, huge player, probably going to be an even bigger player in the future when it comes to healthcare. 
Um, it goes, just goes to show you that you enter a market in a specific way, and then you show many players in that market, look, this is what we can do for the overall industry. And I think this is also one of the main points that you're making in your post, which I'm going to pull up uh, right now, if everybody can see this correctly. I think it's zoomed in. So uh, I'll start with the title. So Palantir at $1 trillion, does it need a consumer product? I say no. I mean, you say no. <laughs> <laughs> While the idea is fascinating, it's a mere utopia. So if uh, you would like to, to continue, the, the well, podium I is all yours. From uh, a little premise, there are many things uh, in uh, the dreams uh, of uh, Palantir investors. One is uh, Palantir becoming a $1 trillion company. I think this idea of uh, the one trillion was when it first uh, reached uh, the a hundred million dollars uh, when it was uh, completely hyped in 2021. And uh, what Carp said uh, was, uh, well, I don't really see why this company shouldn't be 20 times uh, bigger. So combined uh, these two elements uh, with uh, some hype. Uh, People started uh, getting uh, super interested in, oh, Palantir 1 trillion, Palantir 1 trillion, Palantir 1 trillion. So there is uh, this in the back of uh, all uh, Palantir investors. But uh, since uh, this is uh, the big dream of seeing uh, officially Palantir becoming uh, a big, big tech, now the, there's uh, the acronym Magnificent, Magnificent 7, we all hope uh, to see Palantir belonging to these uh, acronyms uh, as well. But uh, the way to get that is not uh, clearly homogeneous in the mind uh, of uh, Palantir investors. Especially the conversation gravitated about uh, a question. Does actually Palantir need a consumer product to achieve this uh, one trillion question? And uh, this observation, this uh, thought actually comes from uh, a very grounded uh, reasoning. If we look at the Magnificent Seven, so the biggest uh, seven companies uh, in uh, the world, uh, they all have uh, a B2C, so a consumer component. We see with uh, Amazon, Google, Tesla, Apple, Nvidia. So they all have uh, this uh, consumer component. So does Palantir actually need a consumer component as well in order to reach this $1 trillion market cap? And uh, I provided my answer. In this article, I explicitly said, uh, well, guys, this is a nice uh, utopia, but at the end of the day, it's just an utopia. I don't think Palantir needs a consumer product. And the three simple reasoning I shared was, uh, first, Palantir already is... Uh, the company that tries to solve the most difficult problems, this in the B2B segment, so working with enterprises and with government. I believe uh, these two segments are already difficult enough because uh, Palantir, differently from other, custom other companies, are not uh, completely skewed on one side uh, and they just do something on the other side. Palantir literally has two engines uh, that work together. For instance, uh, Microsoft, uh, Google, Amazon, they all work with the government somehow, but the government contribution is relatively little. So it is just, uh, let's call it a side job uh, apart from the core business. While for Palantir is definitely the core business as it is the core business, the commercial side. And the beauty of Palantir is actually trying to make this uh, to core engine actually work together. And that actually happens in the form of R&D. But this to say that uh, what Palantir is doing, uh, trying to be the standard in the government side and also becoming the operating system of enterprises is already difficult enough. So that would like a thinking of a consumer product would be actually a huge distraction. A distraction for which Palantir has never hinted uh, a willingness to pursue. It doesn't have uh, the skill, I would say. And let me say, even after 20 years of actually 
working with uh, the government and uh, now almost uh, 10 years working with enterprises, we already see that Palantir is not really great yet at selling its product. Imagine this while having uh, the most effective product in the world. So imagine when uh, you're actually selling to a consumer, the skill you need to actually understand <laughs> the consumer is actually a completely different uh, skill set. So even if it would be nice to say, okay, Jarvis, I'll say, okay, Palantir, tell me what uh, I should eat today, give me a receipt uh, and maybe even cook for me. That would be lovely, but uh, I don't personally see Palantir doing that. And it is also a detach from uh, their core mission. Their core mission again is uh, we want to become the operating system of the modern enterprise, the modern government. This uh, as a corollary means uh, that uh, I don't think Palantir will, uh, will actually develop a consumer product on its own. However, if uh, it is true that Palantir wants to become the operating system of the modern uh, enterprises, I see uh, actually very likely that an external company, let's call it uh, a, sec a company that uh, would uh, follow the steps of Apple, let's call it a peer, a peer that uh, wants to, to build a B2C consumer by leveraging full-scale Palantir AAP and all uh, its platform, that could be actually be something that would work to my eyes. Because uh, think of it, what is a personal assistant? A personal assistant is essentially an aggregate of uh, LLM models, LLM uh, agents that uh, work uh, together, but uh, they also combine uh, with the specific need of a consumer. And uh, you also need uh, a company that uh, targets a specific need of a consumer. Palantir so far has worked uh, with uh, cons con consumers, uh, customers of all enterprises, but uh, they are not focused on learning the customers of their customers. They're already thinking just of their, their customers. For instance, Tyson Food, uh, Palantir doesn't really care of understanding uh, how the psychology of the clients uh, who eat uh, chicken. They just need to focus on Tyson Food. So this is the broad uh, answer I, I said. For these reasons, I don't think uh, Palantir actually is willing uh, or will do a consumer product, which uh, destroys the, the dream of Palantir achieving $1 trillion with a consumer product. Yet it left the question open on, uh, wait a second, what Palantir actually need to do to achieve this $1 trillion market cap? Because uh, if we reason on what is this needed to reach this uh, $1 trillion market cap, we could have actually a better understanding on uh, why this uh, idea of the consumer product actually doesn't make sense, uh, or at least it makes uh, little sense. Then again, Palantir is uh, one of those companies that keep a surprise everyone, even uh, people like us who have been uh, studying it uh, very closely every quarter. We try to understand, we, we discuss. Uh, so there is always space for surprise. But let's see how things are for now. Essentially, in order to reach this uh, $1 trillion market cap, there are multiple ways. And the simplest, uh, simplest uh, way to think of it is uh, thinking in terms of uh, revenues. We know that uh, the valuation so the total market cap is nothing else than uh, revenues amount multiplied by a multiple. So what we call EV sales, uh, price to sales. Uh, so 1 trillion is uh, 1,000 billion, and uh, that could be reached on 10x EV sales on $100 billion revenue or 20x on $50 billion revenue, or something in between uh, like 15X uh, on $66 billion revenue. So if uh, we say, let's take uh, the most optimistic case. 
So let's take a very high multiple of 20x sales. Right now we are around 13. So we are very optimistic on getting the least revenues needed to reach this $1 trillion market cap. And we get $15 billion revenue. We still need revenues to 25x the current 2 billion. So this gives a sense of how far this trillion is. And remember, this is a very optimistic case. But okay, let's uh, try to understand. Is there any chances Palantir could actually get there in the long run? And I think the biggest hint we have uh, is by looking uh, at uh, the size of the artificial intelligence software market, which uh, was hinted also by CARP in an interview last year that uh, in around 10 years, this market alone will be one trillion. So if Palantir is actually able to capture a slice of this market, which is expected to grow at around 23% CAGR, as we mentioned previously, Palantir could reach $50 billion in 12 years under the assumption that it could grow more than this market. So 12 years, to grow by growing 30%. That's already very, very optimistic. We have been already optimistic before. 30% CAGR, it is uh, in line with uh, the, preview, the past, but uh, it is hard to say for 12 years, uh, the growth will be this strong. 30% uh, is something that means uh, that uh, essentially every two years, the revenues uh, double. Potentially possible, maybe, it will happen. I hope it will happen, but I would not rely on that. But this to say that uh, if uh, this happens, so Palantir reaches $50 billion in 12 years, Palantir would get only 2% of the total market size uh, by then, because which is uh, what we said uh, is growing by around uh, 23%. So 2% uh, market size of this uh, huge market gives a sense that. Uh, this market is actually big enough. And uh, this is a hint, uh, in my opinion, uh, to say, OK, the market is big enough for Palantir to actually grow to this uh, $50 billion without uh, reinventing completely <laughs> its own, uh, starting building products uh, for, uh, for consumers. But let's make one step further. This $50 billion could be achieved uh, into many different ways. And this is actually helpful to have a sense of uh, what it is truly needed to reach these optimistic uh, revenues. And uh, 20, $50 billion revenue could be acquired uh, by a combination of uh, 25K customers paying around $2 million per year, 10K customers paying an average of $5 million per year, or 6K customers paying a, an average of $8 million per year. I would say these are all ambitious numbers, yet uh, they're not impossible because in 2020, the average was $8 million. And we have to think of uh, the market, so what we shared previously, as something that is not static but keeps growing. So as uh, the world of software actually increases, uh, Palantir doesn't only get more customers, but the existing customers should theoretically expand more and more. And also by growing, Palantir would have more pricing power so that it can transfer the price increases to the consumers. So you see, these numbers are extremely optimistic, yet they're not impossible. What actually Palantir needs in substance actually to get there? What um, Dan Yves actually said the messy of AI. Well, the messy of AI is a simple way to say in order to truly become dominant, Palantir needs to become the standard for uh, any industry. And uh, potentially it could be, but uh, if uh, Palantir doesn't get a standard, it doesn't become a standard, it remains uh, a small player, this vision can be true. So this to say, this uh, $1 trillion is uh, a possibility according to the reasoning we have been done so far. But uh, from here, where Palantir is uh, just uh, scratching the surface, to become the standard of any industry, it is uh, 
a very, very, very long journey. So far, we have been seeing Palantir becoming the standard, I would say, for aviation with Airbus, we discussed previously with uh, Defense. It is uh, a recognized leader. In healthcare, I would say we are getting there. I, would, I can't say we are the standard yet, uh, but uh, certainly the amount of clients, uh, the amount of use cases, the relevance of uh, the clients hint uh, that uh, there is this motion in play of Palantir becoming actually the standard for uh, healthcare. But uh, healthcare is just uh, one uh, sector. And the sector is what brings us to the second angle that I wanted to share. Because uh, Palantir differs a lot uh, from the traditional uh, software categorization, where, which uh, says, uh, or you are a vertical uh, software, or you are a horizontal software. The difference between the two is uh, the depth and how wide uh, the software is deployed. When we think of uh, Salesforce, we think of a platform that is extremely wide and uh, used by a huge amount of users and uh, sectors. Why? Because essentially the software that is used by Coca-Cola, the Salesforce uh, Coca-Cola uses, is uh, probably very similar to the one used by Airbus. Certainly there are some customization, but in the grand scheme of things, uh, it is uh, still <laughs> the same uh, platform. On the other hand, uh, we could have uh, software like uh, Viva, which is built on Salesforce, which tackles very specific uh, um, vertical. Viva is a uh, Salesforce, but tailored for the healthcare industry. So two observation. Salesforce the, is the biggest horizontal uh, software platform and already have $20 billion in revenue and still grows at around 10, 20%. This means that a horizontal software, mainly focused on CRM, they also have uh, Slack, they also have uh, um, that platform uh, Tableau and also some uh, other software to make more uh, analytics. But at the end of the day, that is uh, mainly CRM, still generated the $20 billion revenue. 20 billion for one horizontal <laughs> software. Okay, let's combine with uh, the second uh, component on the vertical uh, businesses. Viva, which is just one sector, one vertical healthcare, reached uh, $2 billion in uh, revenue. And also here, it is growing uh, quite nicely. Now let's make uh, a comparison with Palantir. Palantir doesn't uh, really have uh, an horizontal uh, platform, but uh, it neither is uh, a completely vertical platform. Palantir is uh, something that could be deployed at scale into any industry, but it also has the depth that potentially is required to work into any sector. So it is the combination of uh, an horizontal software platform and a vertical software platform. And Palantir currently operates not in one, not in two, but in 40, more than 40 verticals. And the simple reasoning uh, I, I shared was uh, if uh, Salesforce can generate a $20 billion by focusing uh, essentially on uh, one simple horizontal platform, and uh, Viva can generate uh, $2 billion only focusing on one vertical, and I would say in one vertical, they provide the CRM, which is neither the most sophisticated use case. If we make uh, this uh, simple reasoning of uh, multiply giving uh, Palantir 2 billion from each sector, multiplying by 40 sectors, we reach uh, $80 billion revenue, which is uh, more than enough to potentially reach uh, this uh, famous $1 trillion market cap by having a multiple of around uh, 15 times because uh, we said previously with $50 billion revenue, with a 20x multiple, we reach uh, 1 trillion. So this uh, long journey to say, look, uh, the market of AI is big enough so that uh, Palantir could reach that scale uh, and still have uh, a relatively little 
size of the market. I personally expect Palantir to increase the, its share in uh, this huge $1 trillion market cap one day. But going deeper, if we make a stricter reasoning on saying, let's take the verticals Palantir currently operates in, and let's assume Palantir becomes the standard of uh, each of these verticals. And uh, as we mentioned previously, we have been seeing uh, Palantir becoming the standard in defense, in the aviation. Probably right now we are in the path of seeing uh, healthcare being transformed and gradually over time, Palantir becomes a standard of uh, each industry. Then this idea of uh, Palantir requiring a consumer product doesn't really make any sense because all these industries by working with B2B customers are already enough to generate potentially enough revenues so that uh, these uh, 50, 80 billion dollar revenues could be generated. Again, this is a, a very long-term ambitious goal. It required uh, more than 10 years, certainly, by growing 30%, which is already very optimistic. And uh, probably most of investors will drop uh, previously. Hopefully we will not. <laughs> but uh, this uh, reasoning, in my opinion, says, okay, what is uh, a dream for many investors is actually just a mere utopia. It uh, doesn't really make any sense. What do you think? Does uh, this uh, B2B utopia make any sense to you? So I had so many things to say, but I was like, okay, let him, let him speak. Um, so at first, you know, when I read this, I was like 12, 12 years out, a lot of individual investors will already opt out after seeing those 12 years, especially after seeing all the previous uh, Palantir to a trillion dollar titles, thinking maybe in the next five years, it will already be to a trillion dollars. But I think people need to realize what a trillion dollar actually means. Um, but then you you illustrated it in a, in a very good and, and easy way to understand. So the, the multiples here, the 10, 15 and 20 times sales, Okay, at first, when you look at that, and then you see the, the current $2.2 billion in, uh, in revenue, you're like, whoa, this is a very, very long way to go, right? I mean, mm -hmm. it is, it still is a, an extremely long way, long way to go. Then we look at the AR markets, how fast that's growing. We are expecting that Palantir outgrows the, the current rate. Currently, that's not the case, but we're looking forward, not backwards. So I was like, okay, you know what? Let's let's do that. Then with the thirty year with the thirty percent Kager to reach fifty billion, fifty, not a hundred, not sixty six, not eighty, fifty billion. That would take approximately twelve years. So I was like, okay, even in a very very optimistic scenario, trillion dollars maybe twelve years from now. But then when we looked at the industries that they operate in, which are forty industries currently, which I think, I mean, I don't even know how many other industries there are out there. It really seems like they're they're in every other industry that exists on the planet. And taking the Viva Salesforce example, $2 billion in revenue from just one, one industry here, which is healthcare, which by the way, $2 billion in revenue from just healthcare is very, very little when you look at the overall healthcare spending um, each and every year. And I'm only talking about the United States here. If we go worldwide, I mean, or UK or Europe, um, that number becomes even bigger. Um, then you're like, huh, only $2 billion per industry doesn't really seem that far-fetched, mm -hmm. right? Of course, there are some industries here where $2 billion, maybe Palantir will not really be looking at those industries to grow or, or to put many resources into that, but it, it doesn't really need to because there are plenty of other industries where it will be two plus a zero after that when it comes to revenues, um, especially when it comes to defense, agriculture, um, healthcare, you name it. So the more and more you think about it, the more and more like, okay, if they can execute, if boot camps are growing quite fast and are essentially after that successful if the pricing is right then you're trying to put everything into consideration while also being a bit realistic and you're like huh 
reaching these highs, hun hundreds of billions of dollars in market cap, I don't think that is so far-fetched. Now, again, trillion dollars, still very, very large number. A lot of things have to go right for it to reach that number. It will not happen in a couple of years. I mean, the best case scenario here is, is 12 years growing at 30%. So we're like, hmm, okay, seems quite reasonable. And this is, again, without a pure consumer product, meaning consumer, you and me and everybody watching watching this video. Um, so yeah, I mean, the market, the big B2C, B2, I mean, B2B, B2G, which is government, for them is already a huge, huge market. If they didn't have government, then I would say, yeah, yeah forget about it. Um, I, I don't think we will, we will reach that. But yeah, essentially, they are building now products for specific clients, like we've discussed with Airbus. And then their customers down the line, down the supply chain, actually, are using Palantir in a way. Um, and I think we're going to see those network effects grow and grow as Palantir offers its solutions to many, many more industries, many more customers in each of those industries. Again, we go back to the point where the AI bootcamp, the AIP bootcamps have to be extremely good. They have to continue uh, to explain the product quite well, bring customers that see positive results. Because again, this is this is why we value these software companies price to sales, because sales is, is a very important aspect because the margins are usually always the same. Um, so yeah, while I do think it is still far-fetched, it is putting the numbers here like, like, like you've done, it could become a reality. Now, even if we only get 50% of that reality, I think uh, most of us are going to be quite quite happy with that. We surely would not complain. <laughs> yeah, exactly, we should we would not complain. Um, there is someone here, Red Fox, saying, "How about car manufacturing?" I just found out BMW, Ferrari, Tesla through Penya. Uh, Penya. Panasonic. Uh... Oh, yeah, the the battery. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yes, well, you in see, a way, well, Ferrari is more direct, and BMW is also more direct. So you see. Um... Um, the other day, I was uh, talking with uh, a very smart investor who have been uh, talking with me last year, I, and he was uh, very intrigued by by Palantir, and uh, he asked me again, uh, "Wow, so what what you were saying about Palantir unlocking value at the NHS, uh, Palantir actually being coming uh, a competitive advantage, makes me think uh, of wait a second." Potentially, we could invest into companies uh, that are actually Palantir clients if uh, the result is uh, what happened to Airbus, where essentially Boeing, uh, well, they started together, Boeing went uh, flat and declining, while Airbus uh, keep rising because uh, the disgrace from uh, Boeing actually becomes a benefit for, uh, for Airbus. And uh, from this... He asked me, Arnie, what are the sectors where you think uh, this uh, platform Palantir can actually unlock the biggest value? Because intrinsically is, uh, okay, where is the biggest Delta profit where, which could be generated? And my first answer was uh, healthcare. Also today I shared uh, a post that uh, why Palantir is booming in healthcare. Yeah. And that comes essentially Maybe for- I can uh, pull it up. Um... Yeah, it's this. That essentially comes from uh, three reasons. Healthcare generates an insane amount of data, but accessing it, uh, it is a challenge. It is a challenge because, for instance, from the IP conference that we have been seeing, uh, a lot of data is still recorded by hands, and uh, hands uh, <laughs> handwriting uh, is not really digestible on its own. You can't really make analysis on... Uh, data written by hand. Then uh, you need uh, not only the data in place, but you need a very strong uh, foundation to actually understand uh, what your data is, call it uh, ontology, to exploit AI. And uh, there is also a lot of uh, regulation uh, hinting uh, of, uh, okay, you want to use AI, you need to follow these uh, strict rules. And the combination of uh, these three elements explains uh, 
probably not all, but a big chunk of uh, why Palantir is succeeding in uh, healthcare. So what is the archetype uh, for uh, healthcare? Very important industry, a huge amount of data. Industries still, an industry still uh, very linked to legacy systems. So there is a lot of data, a lot of information that is not really unlocked, uh, therefore it can't really provide uh, value. So the archetype uh, that I shared was, uh, okay, healthcare is probably a very big beneficiary. And the second segment uh, was uh, deep engineering and complex. Uh, we said previously Airbus. Airbus is probably an excellent case study, not only because it worked, uh, but it, because it had uh, the, the prerequisites to actually fully exploit uh, the platform. Because uh, let's say a media company already has uh, all its uh, digital assets by its nature, okay? While uh, an Airbus needs uh, a lot of uh, manufacturing uh, segments, process to actually build something that is physical. So there is a lot of complexity. And uh, car makers are essentially a proxy of uh, Skywise, sorry, um, a proxy of Airbus, just uh, tailored uh, on uh, something that is uh, relatively simpler, but still uh, very complex, like a car. Huge supply chain uh, mess, uh, huge mess in actually evo uh, generating the processes. So car manufacturing is uh, something that we see Palantir is uh, really building on. And uh, here we mentioned uh, BMW, Ferrari, Tesla is uh, more or less involved, uh, but certainly its provider of batteries, uh, Panasonic, uh, is uh, heavily involved. They even presented at uh, IPCON, meaning that uh, it's not uh, a pilot, uh, but uh, there is a confirmation of uh, a lot of things uh, running on. So, and uh, we also have a lot, but truly a lot of uh, links uh, that were uh, published by Ether Square. We have uh, uh, the Stellantis group uh, heavily reliant. Probably they were the first uh, car, car, um, car manufacturer uh, uh, client of, uh, of Palantir because uh, the, I remember old use cases uh, of auto quality control back in 2016, 17 or so. So probably after healthcare, we will see a lot of car uh, manufacturing uh, uh, clients evolving uh, with Palantir. Remember that Airbus took uh, many years to become uh, a hundred million dollar customer, but uh, it takes time. But if they already have uh, the biggest players in the industry, even Volkswagen was uh, supposed to be a client because there were uh, active links. Uh, and uh, also subsidiaries uh, of uh, Stellantis. Uh, so to say these clients are expected to become uh, incredibly bigger. We have uh, enough substance to say, okay, the car segment is expected to grow a lot. Also think this way. Now we know that Tesla is very ahead compared with the competition and what the competition can do apart from, uh, okay, let's become a tech heavy company like uh, Tesla so that uh, we try at least uh, to catch up because uh, the true advantage uh, Tesla has is uh, able, being able to attract uh, the best software engineers. The key difference from Tesla and uh, the other legacy companies is that uh, Tesla is essentially a tech software company that happens to build uh, hardware like uh, Unreal uh, is uh, a tech company generating software that empowers hardware. While uh, the automakers, the legacy automakers are uh, engineering, uh, mechanical engineering companies that they need to make uh, also some software because now everyone wants uh, some software, but uh, that's not uh, their deep expertise. So the only way they can have to survive, in my opinion, is actually leveraging something like Palantir to essentially cut up all the software problems by leveraging uh, an updated uh, 
software infrastructure that Palantir provides so that uh, they can actually focus on building cars because that's what they excel on, not uh, building software to empower the cars. So I think uh, in some cases, uh, Palantir helps uh, having an advantage, but for instance, for legacy companies, it becomes a matter of uh, survival. Yeah, I mean, it's when you think about it, it's it's like someone comes into your industry and basically completely changes the way you've been operating for for years and decades, while you can still operate your company the way you've been doing before. If you do not adapt, basically survival of of the fetus. In this case, it's survival of those that can innovate. Uh, faster, which is Tesla's mode, which is the pace of innovation here. So yeah, getting getting the best software out, out there obviously requires great engineers. I believe Shyam said in the in the interview today, uh, in Ukraine, the drones there, it needs to be, uh, let's call it refreshed, rethinked, rethought about every six months. Um, that's how fast things go these days in 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 wars in defense. So. Again, think about the potential here with regards to defense spending. Only 1% needs to go, let's say, to, to software uh, defense companies, which in my opinion should be should be way more uh, in the future. With Fed Start, of course, Palantir gains from, from, from that as well. Uh, I've got great links with Andrew, which again, tremendous company. Um, so yeah, I mean, moving into going back to the car, the auto manufacturer, it makes sense, especially after what we've seen with Skywise Airbus. It makes sense. Um, we've talked about in the past, remember Oceanwise, and when that was presented, we're like, okay, that also makes a lot of sense, mm -hmm. um, especially right now with everything that's been happening there in, in the Red Sea with the supply chain issues and shipping containers. Um, but even without that, I, I think it's an industry that also needs a, a little uh, tech revival, which we haven't heard anything new since... Uh, since that presentation, which I found a bit a bit strange, but we'll see. But again, this is another industry that will definitely generate more than $2 billion in revenue. Um, but yeah, the car industry, uh, airspace, airlines, shipping, if, if that becomes a, a big thing in the future. And there is definitely, there is definitely some, some ways to go. And then there's obviously Fed Start, but that's, that's uh, back to the government side of things. A uh, simple reasoning uh, I I had previously, maybe it's, it's complete trash, so I'll ask you your feedback. But uh, have you noticed how many hospitals, uh, big hospitals, are uh, operating uh, with uh, with Palantir? Right now, honestly, I can't really size uh, how big these hospitals are. But essentially, to reach uh, two billion dollar uh, revenues in healthcare, you essentially need uh, twenty customers paying. Sorry, ten customers. Uh, no, so twenty customers are paying you a hundred million dollar per year. So that, like, put this way, that is not so insane. If we think uh, how deep uh, Palantir can be entrenched, uh, we already know that Palantir already has uh, more than fifteen percent uh, of uh, the hospitals in the US running through Palantir. So imagine if uh, that becomes. Uh, something like 50% uh, and then at that point uh, that uh, remaining from 50 to 80, 90 would uh, increase uh, very dramatically because uh, that means uh, becoming the standard. Yeah, and I mean, even the, the, the higher you go in that percentage, you don't even need to add that more, more percentage because the number of dollars you would add just with another 5%, another 10% is going to be way bigger than the 50% we added before from 10 to 20, mm -hmm. from 20 to 30. Um, and, and that's what I think will happen afterwards is just the dollar amounts added is going to be so much bigger. Um, we've seen that, I mean, I've seen that with, with AWS, for example, they might not grow percentage wise as fast as the other players. But if you do look at the dollar amount, the dollar amount is as big, if not bigger mm -hmm. than, the, than the other players. And I think that's, Obviously, this is not the case right now with Palantir, still generating only two, two point one, two point two billion billion uh, a year in revenue. But as we grow, 
I, I think that's that's what we're we're going to see, not just for healthcare, not just for government, but for for all the other verticals out there as well. Um, I want to I want to read this comment first. So healthcare also has strict permissions and data accounting requirements. This will be crucial in more industries, and Palantir probably gained a lot of knowledge there from government work. Yeah, for sure, it, uh, it was also a very big deal with the NHS uh, with the NHS I I issue, um, which, by the way. The I've seen I've seen the post lately on, on on X how how the NHS are treating more and more patients more efficiently etc cetera, etc. Cetera. Have you have you tweeted out about about this? Maybe I might have missed it. Um, with regards to confirmation, if Palantir's effect is truly already um, baked in, or is this an effect of of something that happened uh, uh, before? Well, uh, I, I think uh, that is uh, truly the effect of. Uh what Pantir has already been doing uh, because uh, it is not uh, that until the contract was officially official mm -hmm. that uh, Pantir was not contributing. Actually, it was uh, quite the opposite. Pantir, the, essentially the play I think happened uh, was, uh, okay, with uh, the previous contracts, we expand the usage essentially while, while not... Uh, being uh, officially under contract so we don't get uh, additional revenues from it but uh, we have been seeing uh, a lot of active links shared by Ether Square. we have been seeing uh, the results from uh, the pilots that were run into multiple of these uh, trust so the activity was not static and essentially what all the work that Palantir has done through last year was uh, essentially a way to provide evidence uh, of, uh, look, we know we are at a disadvantage because we are a US company and for political reasons, it is uh, not that easy to make uh, us in. On the other hand, uh, we provide you strong evidence that uh, by spending uh, this big amount of money, this around, uh, how much is it? Uh, $500 million uh, contract. We are You are not going to waste money, but you are actually developing something uh, that uh, delivers, works, uh, save lives, uh, save cost. Because uh, what I understood is that uh, also the NHS tried to build something like this uh, years ago, but essentially the project failed. And uh, when uh, a project, uh, an IT project failed, that is completely failed, like gone. <laughs> so imagine uh, the um, UK government preferred to deal with a Palantir, which has uh, the brand of being Peter Thiel, who backed a Trump a spy company, controversial and black box, whatever preferred this respite uh, very strong activism uh, backed uh, by a billionaire, jo George Soros. They preferred the Palantir over alternatives. This to me is a simple hint uh, that uh, when Palantir does something, it could be weird, uh, but at the end of the day, they know what uh, they're doing. And more importantly, it means uh, that uh, compared with alternatives, it is truly like... Uh, Carp says, uh, we are uh, 10x better. Because uh, if that were not true, if uh, the marginal value that Pantheon could provide was just a little bit better, probably it would not, being, uh, would not have been worth uh, getting the political risk. Yeah, no, I, I, uh, I agree. I mean, a lot of people think, oh, they, I mean, that's what I said at the start. He, he the, you have to walk, walk the walk, yeah, something like that. Um, if you say that your product is 10 times better and you keep saying that, there's probably some truth to it because other managements has probably said things about their products being so good, et cetera, et cetera. But after a while, if the results don't match those promises, they stop saying that. Um, isn't it so, uh, the same uh, uh, in the initial part of the stream uh, you mentioned? Uh, Carp looked uh, so confident, uh, confident in the interviews at Davos. And there are two options there. 
he's a confidence for a reason or uh, he's a confidence scammer. So I, I think mm -hmm. uh, that people who dig the dug <laughs> into Palantir for uh, a lot of time uh, and also in depth, they realize, uh, okay, this company is not joking. Uh, this is not a scam. But I can understand why on surface, it seems uh, Carp is a, is a con artist because uh, that mm -hmm. of confidence is what uh, you see from people without the substance to compensate this lack of substance. While Palantir CEO Alex Carp is actually confident because uh, he knows uh, <laughs> the software actually works and it is not only as a commenting, but uh, when there are the customers who are happy to show results, uh, we see it uh, already like over these three years, uh, it is even hard to recap all the uh, the effects, the net benefits Palantir generated. At this point, I would say there is enough confidence, enough, uh, sorry, enough uh, evidence to say, okay, we're not uh, dealing with a scam. Yeah, and I mean, uh... Yeah, I, I can understand when you see the guy with such crazy hair um, talking in not so conventional way. I think that's the biggest that's the biggest thing. The same with Elon, right? Because they don't do things in a conventional way. These companies don't do the same thing as other companies. Follow the rules, follow the overlords. We're going to do this and that and not talk about controversial stuff. Um, that's obviously attracting a lot of of negative uh, negativity ar around those companies, around those people. But again, it's all about executing, proving, proving the haters wrong and proving that their software works. And so the customers pay for great software, the clients are happy, the people working at those companies are happy, especially in healthcare, especially in hospital where work is not that very well paid. You work long hours. And so it is in their benefit to have the best software because it makes the lives of the people that are working for you much, much better as well. Um, and with regards to 100 million is a lot for healthcare companies to pay. It's not necessarily healthcare companies, it's more hospitals and stuff like that, which have a huge, huge budget. And 100 million, I don't really think is that much mon money for the size of, of huge uh, US hospital institutions. Um, Maybe. For hospitals, yes, uh, but if we include uh, healthcare as overall, including also the big pharma and so on. Uh, Insurance million, providers. Uh, I mean, it is a lot, uh, but it is not a lot compared with the size of these uh, huge companies. Like if yeah. you pay $100 million and you're already saving, uh, let's say, $300 million, you're already more than incentivized to actually spend a lot. Yeah, I mean, it makes sense. You spend money to make money. So, um, yeah, uh, it yeah, it's it's going to be an interesting period because I do think that, with regards to the government side, of course, with everything that's going on around the world, I think they are probably going to gain some traction with political landscape maybe switching a bit with high tech companies, tech companies being a bit more involved in decision making. Um, of course, there is there are lots of elections around the world big election in the United States as well. I, I do think we're going to see a lot, a lot of change um, this year, but especially starting 2025, I think we're going to see negative, positive changes as well, but things that will definitely affect Palantir's business um, in the coming years. Um, ooh, nice uh, catch. <laughs> I play um, basketball as well. Ah. <laughs> Um, Mark here asks, hey guys, can you explain the difference between Palantir and I think this is Fortinet? Mm -hmm. um, well, they're completely different, uh, completely different. One is a cybersecurity, pure cybersecurity. The other is a, a CIA asset. So, Well, uh, I, I also received uh, this question of, uh, but is Palantir actually selling cybersecurity? And uh, that is a tough ans uh, question to answer because uh, in the previous years, so if you look at the old website of uh, Palantir, there even was uh, like a clear cybersecurity offering uh, called uh, Palantir Cyber. But uh, what we know more recently is that uh, all the solutions Palantir provides 
intrinsically have uh, their own cybersecurity offering. So everything uh, that stays in the Pantheon parameter is already protected uh, with cybersecurity. So I don't think uh, Pantheon actually provides cybersecurity as uh, a service on uh, other products, yet uh, there is uh, certainly a cybersecurity component in uh, all what uh, they, they share. And uh, Apollo, in uh, a demo, was mentioned about uh, how Apollo actually helped uh, solving a big problem, a vulnerability that was uh, called uh, log, uh, log4 and other malware to actually make uh, Morgan Stanley secure. So from my understanding, Palantir doesn't really sell cybersecurity as a software, as a, as a solution. All the solution, all the cybersecurity, sorry, all the offering it provides are already incorporated uh, of uh, cybersecurity safety. And uh, that is, uh, is even backed uh, by the fact that uh, Palantir works uh, with uh, the government. Therefore, everything they do needs to be more than uh, cyber cyber proof. Yeah, which is exactly why why I wanted to show this. It's exactly that since since they are working with government uh, customers, it is embedded in in the solutions. But if you're looking at something like uh, CrowdStrike type of of cyber uh, Palo Alto type of cyber, I think they have more specified products than what Palantir is is currently currently offering. In my opinion, that's I think a full answer for both of us. Uh, if there are any more questions, let us know in the chat. If not, um, if, if Arnie has something else to, to tell us, something we missed, um, let us know. But other than that... What are uh, your personal expectations for Q4? To be honest, my expectations are, are really not really not that high. I, I think I, I answered this question not so long ago. Maybe I will contradict myself this time. Uh, maybe not. I, th I think I think it was with you the last the last earnings uh, the last earnings report. Oh yeah. Okay. Before I answer, there was a. Since we are expecting interest rates to drop, right? Palantir makes in makes uh, interest income, which has definitely <laughs> helped them become uh, profitable. It is going to be essential for them for the core business to become more profitable as interest rates go down. Now, of course. I don't expect interest rates to go from five point something to zero, and so they'll earn nothing um, with regards to interest income. But I am, I mean, the fact that they are pretty confident that they are going to be profitable from here on out, they probably already know that interest rates will come down. And so the money gained from interest income becomes a bit lower. They know the, the profitability of the business, the core business is doing better and better and better each and every quarter. Does I think sense? they're not uh, scared at all about this uh, interest rate thing uh, for the simple reason that um, if you look at the um, uh, operating uh, margin, so the EBIT margin, which by definition is before the interest rate mm -hmm. uh, impact, uh, that is already quite uh, positive. And now, now the precise number is uh, 7%. So, so far we are gap a gap positive uh, on the net income with a 13% net income uh, margin and uh, on the EBIT margin gap so before the interest and taxes we are at 7% a percentage that has been uh, gradually increasing from minus 49 <laughs> essentially when Palantir went uh, listed in 2020 so mm -hmm. it was awful. Pantheon was essentially really l destroying a shareholder value back then and gradually decreasing uh, to barely negative, uh, to barely positive, uh, to now, I would say, starting starts to become uh, very positive. I And we have to think this way. If interest rates remain high, we keep uh, 
making this uh, interest income. But uh, if interest rates decrease, uh, that uh, creates uh, a lot of incentive for CEOs, CTOs to actually invest money into transformational projects. Because uh, when uh, you like uh, when you're a manager and you try to understand, okay, does this project actually make sense? What you do is essentially making a DCF of the project. If interest mm -hmm. rates decrease, uh, it is way easier to have a net positive uh, value from uh, your projects. So you are more incentivized to make more projects. So I would say if interest rates decrease effectively, yes, less uh, interest income. But on the other hand, uh, you would have uh, way more project, more, way more incentive uh, for the management, management teams across the world to actually deploy uh, these uh, IT budgets. For instance, during the pandemic, uh, also the revenue was generally higher, also on the commercial side. True, the size was uh, relatively smaller, but in general, the software market uh, went very strong because of this dynamic. Capital was essentially free, so a lot of companies said, okay, let's invest uh, a lot of money in software. Yeah, I mean, when interest rates do come down, risk is going to be on. I mean, companies are going to spend more money, um, become a bit, let's say, riskier. Um, so yeah, going back to the question you asked, you asked before. Now again, it, my expectations are being put pretty low, and I believe um, Emir did did a poll right no, at the end of uh, at the end of last year, um, asking asking each and every day uh, questions. And then we can uh, value the the current, let's say, fair value of of, pay, of PayPal. He did it for PayPal as well, but for Palantir. Um, and even though, even though people voted for quite, I mean, I think twenty seven percent revenue growth, <clears throat> free cash flow margin. Um, what was it? Just a second. Free cash flow margin twenty seven percent, dilution four point four four point two with a WAC of 11.57 um, and the fair value was $12.79 <laughs> per share. So um, yeah, I mean, you see, even with 27% uh, growth in revenue and all of the other assumptions, share price right now is, is let's say, expensive. But no, I do, I do still expect, fully expect over 20% top and bottom line. Um, revenue growth but i do i don't want to see re acceleration of growth so q1 q2 q3 being better one after after the other of course in a profitable way which i do think we're, we're, we're going to see um but that's just the the headline numbers seeing seeing definitely more commercial commercial clients i have very little expectations when it comes to europe uh, for this year especially united states i've uh, i don't think we should be scared i think that they've proven that the us again is a big market for them and and becoming bigger and bigger but uh to the comments uh you shared previously uh, uh, from carpet davos uh, he hinted uh, yes the us will take uh, the, the entire mm -hmm. AA market not europe <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I mean, he, he said uh, if our product was a startup in Germany, it would it would be the best one there, and we have five five of those. <laughs> um, I don't know if if he's trying to like poke the bear there and say, uh, "You guys suck, so come <laughs> come become our clients to become a bit better." But uh, I think uh, the German proudness. Yeah, I mean, he does talk German, so maybe that helps. Um, but yeah, no, I, I think I mean I, I believe your expectations for this year also higher than last year for sure i mean okay yeah. higher than last year i don't think that that's that's, that's so difficult but uh yeah reacceleration of growth across across the whole business i think is the is the headline i would say for me do you personally see the stock is uh, expensive right now so today i was thinking uh, about exactly the same the same question um i was like should i add today should i not add today Eventually, I did not add. Oh, he's bearish. No, I'm not bearish. I didn't add because right now I'm fully comfortable waiting for another two, two and a half weeks. Um, if the stock jumps, 
because of the numbers, because the numbers are great and outlook are great, great. My position goes up as well. But if some somehow the market reacts negatively, then I'll have a better opportunity to have. Mm -hmm. So I'm like on the sidelines right now. It's again, it's the same, I think, uh, Antonio Linares or something, his name uh, with the chess piece logo uh, profile mm -hmm. picture. He did ask about AMD, the same question, is AMD today expensive? And I answered the same thing. No matter what my answer will be today, after the earnings report and call, definitely my answer might be completely different. Um, mm -hmm. It's the same with NVIDIA last year before they announced their huge guidance. Things can change extremely, extremely fast. I mean, it could, I mean, technically speaking, it looks expensive today, technically speaking, fundamentally mm -hmm. speaking, let's say. Mm -hmm. But if suddenly the comments made by management are much, much better than the expected growth, suddenly what you thought an hour ago makes no sense anymore. Mm -hmm. and, and and it becomes and it becomes cheaper. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah. Personally, I'm uh, more speculative here. <laughs> and I say that because I, I've been uh, adding these, uh, these weeks. Uh, I added a bit also today and essentially the public portfolio I'm sharing uh, was uh, around uh, 60, per, 60, 70 percent uh, when uh, Palantir was uh, was high, and now is uh, 90 percent Palantir and 5 percent uh, Robin, 5 percent Absera. I'm uh, I recognize I'm a bit more speculative here, but the reasoning is uh, quite uh, simple. I can afford the risk of, uh, let's say, the earnings uh, disappoint a little bit, but the trajectory is intact, which I think that's the, the bear case. But uh, I actually see a lot of substance that gives me confidence uh, in this process uh, of analysts uh, having to readjust uh, their estimates from these 20% uh, uh, for five years, which is mm -hmm. what uh, they expect. Uh, I think they will uh, gradually increase. And I said that uh, for for the multiples reason I shared, uh, even uh, also from a more, how can I say, speculative uh, side of uh, the management, since uh, they are uh, exposing themselves a lot, saying, uh, okay, there is unprecedented demand, uh, the products we are selling are selling strong, uh, we have uh, the NHS deal, we have uh, multiple deals uh, in healthcare supporting that. And uh, I also would say, if uh, I were uh, the management right now, I need my employees uh, to be very incentivized to feel, let's say, it, feel the hype of uh, this AI moment, not being scared of uh, the stock going down. So if I were the management right now, I would say this is the right moment to, to show that you are convinced in pursuing a very strong, uh, strong uh, path. And talking more, spec more uh, technically about the valuation, essentially we are very, very close to the $14, $15 per share that uh, we had uh, pre-Q3 results the results after which uh, the stock uh, basically mooned uh, plus 20 or something percent, which I would say it was maybe too much, uh, but uh, there were good reasons. And uh, so far, apart like from there, we got uh, the NHS, we got uh, multiple deals, even big deals like uh, the two hospitals I mentioned. Uh, we had uh, Unicredit uh, and uh, some other stuff. No. So far, not too much on the defense side, but we know they are working there. So if uh, we think that the stock jumped uh, these uh, 20% or so after Q3, and even I would say, I and the stock now is essentially at the starting point before Q3, I don't see that uh, as a, a negative thing. Actually, I would say, okay, there is more space for a surprise rather than a disappointment. And if I look more closely at the multiples right now, at, we are at around 12x EV sales on sales that are expected to grow 20%, which is not uh, that much if it is true what we mentioned. And on price to fit cash flow, we are around at 40, which uh, 
is not little by definition, but uh, let's put it this way. For a company with a 30% free cash flow margin, growing 20% CAGR, that is not already expensive. It's more or less fair because uh, you should need to pay a premium for something that uh, grows this much uh, while also getting a lot of uh, uh, free cash flow. Yet, uh, again, uh, I believe uh, that growth estimates will uh, will change, uh, giving more room uh, for more free cash flow, already assuming the marginality stays uh, around uh, 30%. So um, as also the comment says, uh, I'm more interested on the forward gui guidance than anything else. I think that is what uh, truly will make uh, the stock move uh, rather than the pure Q4 results, because uh, essentially the big question uh, that we have been discussing in uh, this hour and a half is, uh, is there an, enough substance for a revenue acceleration? And if I combine the potential contracts uh, that uh, are set to drop, like the Titan, like uh, the many healthcare uh, contracts that are on the line, uh, backed by the success they're having, uh, Ukraine potentially starting paying, <laughs> Israel potentially starting paying, paying. Uh, I believe there is enough uh, food <laughs> to cook here. Yeah, no, I, I agree. I think, and also, by the way, it's it's when most of the companies provide their guidance for the full year. So that's not just for Palantir. I think a lot of other companies, I mean, PayPal is one of those. And that's, that's the main reason why I didn't add today, despite uh, what I explained before, because I added uh, to PayPal today yet again. Um, but... Yeah, I, th I think guidance, I think, I mean, you're right. Six months, the stock barely moved. Last time after earnings, stock popped. So it might already indicate a little bit um, what might happen once they proved again that, well, the business is continuing to accelerate. And then, yeah, there will be a re-rating uh, across the board. There are currently, I think, 18 analysts um, covering this stock. The majority of them have... I mean, the minority of them have a buy and a strong buy. Majority are sold, are hold, uh, sell and strong and strong sell with the ridiculous price targets. But uh, yeah, I mean, it can move extremely fast, right? It can move extremely fast. We've seen that in the past, and we've seen that with other with other stocks as well. Um, one last thing with Lance here is any entry point into the stock plant here will be a long term gain. Um, I believe we talked about about this on on X. I mean, we're not here to provide uh, financial uh, advice on stuff like that. But even if that is the case, let's say from now on, the stock only goes goes higher. Let's say, I mean, it doesn't make any sense. Wouldn't you, I mean, no, it doesn't disregard what I said. Your question, your question here says any entry point. So obviously it can, it can go lower. Um, say, answering yes to that question would maybe limit your future upside, let's say. Because um, if I say yes, then you say you buy at 16 and tomorrow it drops 10, 20%. You're not adding and it goes up. You're missing here on a lot of, on a lot of future gains, if that makes, if that makes uh, some sense. So yeah, any entry point, I, mean, I would every, say. Every entry point must be contextualized with uh, you're already average price if you already have uh, and what we are willing actually to deploy. So uh, uh, an entry price is different uh, from, uh, okay, I drop uh, a big amount uh, straight uh, into something. Personally, I've been uh, adding and uh, now on this uh, portfolio share uh, publicly, like I reach uh, again this uh, 90% uh, but I started gradually. So I was uh, actually a month ago in uh, more than 30% in uh, Robinhood because on Palantir when it was around $21 per share, I didn't find it appealing to actually deploy cash there. But Robinhood uh, went to the moon and I was happy to sell, sold the big chunk to deploy it on, uh, on Palantir, which meanwhile uh, dropped. But you see, what is uh, potentially reasonable for me doesn't necessarily mean it is reasonable for everyone. And I would say 
I've been studying Palantir for three years to have the confidence of potentially going uh, all in or almost uh, all in. Yeah, I mean, it's really, it depends. it depends on positioning, the amount of money you have on the site, how long your your investing time frame is. Um, answering all of those questions, you can you can get the the full answer. Um, no, you maybe added a little bit of context here. Sorry, I worded it weird. I meant like buy at any point and hold ten plus years and probably see potential gains. I consider these financial opinions than advice. Um, you know, you're you're getting. I mean, you're asking the right questions that that are Arnie said uh, uh, before time frame. Um, but even with ten plus years, if you are willing to add more when it drops, if the business keeps on performing, your ultimate let's say gain becomes bigger than just buying once. And that's it, because um, in the meantime, it can go up, go down, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But one last thing, you're, Annie, you talked about your, the it's two portfolios with the same companies in it, just one more trading, or is it is that the one portfolio, the Robinhood, Panatier, and Upsellera? It is, well, uh, that is uh, the portfolio I, I share. So mm -hmm. this portfolio of around 100K is just uh, Panatier and these other two. Then... Uh, I have another portfolio where I have the shares of Palantir I don't touch and cash, mm -hmm. which potentially I could use to deploy on Palantir more. Okay, fair enough. By the way, Upsellera covered a little bit for those watching. Arnie covered it in his Substack as well a couple of months ago. Very interesting company. Maybe we'll we'll do a, a live stream on that uh, in the future. But if there aren't any new questions, I think we can call it a day, one hour, 41 minutes. I think it was a pretty good one. Um, so thanks again, Arnie, for coming on. Thank you all for thanks to tuning you. in. Um, we'll definitely do this, do this in the future. Palantir, maybe Robin Hood as well. I think it's going to be a big year for them. Um, so yeah, thanks again. Thanks all for tuning and see you all in the next one.